Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute. Uh, my name is John Lanchowski. I'm president of the Institute. And for those of you who are new to us, uh, we are an independent graduate school with five master's programs and a new doctor, professional doctoral program. And uh, this, is, uh, this lecture today is part of a series of uh, extracurricular events that we have here. Uh, about a hundred of them every year on all sorts of relevant subjects. And uh, we're particularly delighted to, to host Kurt Hauser today, who uh, has written an extraordinary book about modern day slavery. Kurt has been a longtime friend of, of IWP. Uh, he has a, a background as an economist and as an investment advisor and manager. He, uh, he's, he's armed with uh, degrees from uh, Stanford University, a, a, a bachelor's and a master in MBA. Uh, he, uh, for, for years, he was uh, the head of an investment firm uh, in San Francisco that uh, managed billions of dollars of, uh, of investments, Wentworth, Hauser, and Violich. Uh, he has, ha has a very strong background in economics and uh, has, been, uh, has published in, in that field in uh, many major national publications. Uh, among, other th among the other things that he has done is he is the author of Hauser's Law, which is a law of economics that has to do with uh, the percentage of, uh, uh, of revenues that are, uh, that are a percentage of, uh, that are a percentage of the, the gross domestic product and the correlation between that percentage and uh, uh, and, and different levels of taxation. It's a remarkable law which uh, gives you some kind of insight about the, uh, uh, what might be the proper uh, and optimal level of taxation. For many years, Kurt has been chairman of the board of the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and continues to be a board member. Um, without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the, the, the podium over to him so that he could tell you about his book, Invisible Slaves, The Victims and Perpetrators of Modern Day Slavery, published by the Hoover Institution Press. And, uh, uh, and I commend this to your attention. Kurt, we're honored to have you here at IWP. John? Well, thank you for braving the weather, and I understand that I am perhaps uh, somewhere between you and either the cocktail hour or your dinner or your family. So let's let's get on with it. Can everybody hear me? Okay, it's a small room, so I don't want to overpower. This morning, globally, somewhere around 45 million people woke up to a life of forced labor, involuntary servitude, violence, sexual abuse, and the inhumanity of the yoke of slavery. Indeed, there are more slaves in the world today than at any time in the past when slavery was a legal institution practiced by every society, civilization, and culture. If you were to take these 45 million people and put them shoulder to shoulder, or more appropriately, chain, chain them together, they would stretch from Maine to California and back again. Various governmental organizations and NGOs, non-governmental organizations, have tried <clears throat> used different methods to try and calculate the extent of slavery in the world today. It's not as though you walk into, let's say, the World Cup soccer stadium and say, all the slaves, raise your hand, all the traffickers, raise your hand. <clears throat> it's like any other underground activity. It's hidden. Uh, the traffickers, the uh, perpetrators are subject to uh, jail sentences, and the slaves are subject to the in 
humanity of their plight as well as potential retribution to not only themselves but their family back in the villages that they came from. Some social workers and volunteers have gone into the field to try and get into the backwoods of where slavery is most prevalent in very impoverished areas, and they've never come out. So like I said, with any kind of underground activity, you have a lot of bribery and corruption that goes on from the very local law enforcement level, uh, and some cases all the way up to the parliamentary level. In the year 2000, the U.S. Con uh, Congress uh, passed the, victim, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and that authorizes uh, Congress to uh, demand of the State Department an annual survey of about 188 countries as to the extent of slavery within their borders, what they're doing about it, do they have uh, the proper penalties involved. And from that, we get uh, these estimates of what, how much slavery there is today in these uh, spread throughout the world. Uh, the State Department ranks countries in three tiers, tier one, tier two, tier three. Tier one would be a country like most um, advanced economies where they recognize that slavery is a problem or they have laws against it and there's punishment and the court system and the judicial system are involved to a tier free com uh, country like Mauritania where slavery, uh, the country first of all is very nomadic, slavery has been a part of their culture since prehistory and uh, they do not recognize slavery as being an evil and uh, there is no law enforcement against it. So that would be, let's say, a tier three country. The State Department then has the ability to sanction that country by cutting off foreign aid or other uh, favors that the U.S. might provide for them. <clears throat> Humans, uh, <clears throat> human trafficking is the globe's second largest criminal activity and the fastest growing one. It's surpassed only by the illicit drug trafficking. The International Labor Association uh, estimates that the profits globally from human trafficking is about $150 billion annually. About two-thirds of that is uh, the sex trade, sex trafficking, and the rest uh, is uh, state-sponsored uh, slavery, which is what you have in North Korea, where you have labor camps, uh, and private sector um, slavery. In terms of uh, just actual numbers of slaves, if we take this 45 million estimate that's done by the Walk Free Foundation, which is an NGO that originates out of uh, Australia, or excuse me, yeah, Australia, <clears throat> uh, the numbers are a little different. About 21% are involved in the uh, sex trafficking. About 10% is state-sponsored, uh, like North Korea, China, Uzbekistan. And the rest is private industry, which would be uh, everything from household help to manufacturing to the textile trade to uh, brothels and the sex trafficking that area. CNN uh, recently was able to film a slave auction in Libya of migrants from Nigeria and several West African countries. The traffickers had coerced these people, the victims, with the promise of a well-paying job. But instead, the victims found themselves to be merchandise to be auctioned off in a warehouse. They advertised them as a good, strong boys for farm work. They were held against their will, beaten, kicked, and some killed. They were sold for an average price of $400, the price of a farm animal in their area. They were co compelled to work without pay, 
According to CNN, these auctions take place once or twice a month. This is the following is a narrative of Abuk, a black African from southern Sudan, who was 12 years old when the Arab militia from the north raided her village and kidnapped her along with other children in the village. She was sold into the slave market of Khartoum. This is her uh, narrative. The turbaned men observed us and pointed at different persons they wanted to buy. The same way they chose their goats and cows from the pens around us. When one of them would then one of them would charge in between us and drag one of us out to her new master. If anyone tried to escape, they would be beaten or killed. Abuk is a 21st century slavery, slave. Another slave narrative is that of Matul. Matul was a 17-year-old girl working as a housekeeper in her native Indonesia. A cousin of her employer in the United States offered her a job in the U.S. Matul jumped at the chance. Who doesn't want to come to the United States? It seemed like a great opportunity, a narrative that you hear quite often, particularly with perhaps the caravan that's coming. As soon as she arrived at the airport in LA, Los Angeles, her new employer confiscated her passport. Over the next several years, Matul was forced to work seven days a week with no pay and confined to the house. I quote her, my master was threatening me saying that if I ran away, the police would arrest me because I did not have a passport and that I would be thrown into jail and raped. Finally, after years of suffering, Matul, who now spoke a little English, passed a note to the nanny next door, help me. The police came, rescued her, and the couple were arrested and imprisoned. Matul was not a faceless victim in some far off place. She was a slave in the middle of one of America's most affluent neighborhoods, Beverly Hills. She had become an invisible slave in the 21st century. She is one of the 15,000 to 20,000 slaves trafficked annually into the United States, according to the CIA. So what is slavery? Modern day slavery is called human trafficking. Aristotle defined slavery as a piece of property, a piece of movable property as distinct from real estate. The League of Nations in their slavery convention of 1926 defined slavery as follows. The status or condition of a person over whom any and all powers attaching to the right of ownership are exercised. This is called chattel slavery. Chattel is the uh, old Anglo-French word for cattle, like you own your cattle. So the owned and the owner. After World War II, the United Nations expanded the definition of slavery to include forced labor, forced marriage, child labor exploitation, including child soldiers, and debt bondage. Under debt bondage, a person offers themselves or a family member as collateral for a loan. If the loan is not repaid, the person becomes the property of the creditor until the loan is repaid, which it never is because the interest charged on the loan causes the amount of loan to grow faster than the wage does. Another form of chattel slavery. Another form of debt bondage is when a person offers the pledge of work for a loan. Typically the debtor is not paid enough, again, to offset the loan and the interest charged. That obligation can be passed from one generation to the next. 
Upwards of 20 million people today, globally, are debtor slaves. Another form of chattel slavery. So ownership and property are a key component of slavery. Orlando Patterson, a prominent, well-known American slave, slavery scholar, adds that the following are also key components of slavery. Violence and dishonor. Violence or the threat of dis or the threat of violence at an early stage of the trafficking enterprise is an important psychological component in developing the dependency of the victim to the master, like the dog to the dog owner. An example of violence and dishonor is expressed <clears throat> by Mendy. Mendy like uh, Abu mentioned earlier, was, a, was captured in a raid on her village in southern Sudan by the militia Arabs of the north. She was sold in Khartoum to a master that worked her 16 hours a day, seven days a week, without pay. The master ended up as the ambassador to London from the Sudan. She went to London as his slave. Her narrative, my master beat me, abused me, and killed any sense I once had of my own worth. My master was in absolute control and held the power of life or death over me and had completely destroyed my sense of my own identity and my own self-worth. I believed that I was no longer valuable as a human being. So there's both violence and dishonor. Mendy, who experienced both <clears throat> uh, of these, eventually escaped and wrote a book called Slave. She's a 21st century slave. Family separation is another, third, another characteristic of slavery that Orlando Patterson brought up. Patterson calls it natal, as in birth, natal separation, or natal alienation. As through sale, auction, or debt, or gift, excuse me. From the beginning of time, slaves taken as captives in war or raids lost all contact with their family and ancestors. Frederick Douglass, the son of a white slave master and black slave mother stated, genealogical trees do not flourish among slaves. Mende mentioned earlier expresses this sense of family separation. I was overcome with grief, but none more than anything. I was filled with an intense loneliness. I had been enfolded with love and kindness all my life. Now I was completely and utterly alone. Another slave narrative is that of Shaimiya, who was sold into slavery at age eight by her mother to pay for a loan. Her master moved her to the US <clears throat> with them as their slave with forged papers. She escaped, became an abolitionist, and wrote a book entitled Hidden Girl, The True Story of a modern day child slave. The title of her book was the inspiration for my title of Invisible Slaves. Shaima describes her experience. The master made me feel like a nobody. I believe that the only way I kept any dignity or sense of self was during the few hours I had by myself in the middle of the night. During the day, I had to be subservient keep my eyes lowered, even though I was often seething inside. An additional slave narrative is that of Ren John, a debtor slave in Pakistan. He labors seven days a week in a coal-fired brick kiln factory. I borrowed 40,000 rubies, about $500, to buy food for my children. I will never pay it back before I die. 
His employer keeps his wages to repay the loan, but the wages do not cover the loan, as we've seen in other cases. So the debt increases every month and can be passed on to his children. India has the highest number of slaves in the world, estimated to be about 18 million, with a very large population. They include chattel slavery, debt bondage, sex slavery, child slavery, and forced labor. Poverty is the driving force for trafficking. A trafficker will approach a family in a village who will offer a good paying job to one of the children. The family sees this as an opportunity for their child to escape the poverty and social class that they are in. The trafficker then either sells the slave to another trafficker or transports the victim and sells the victim, the slave, to a manager of a farm, a garment maker, a rug maker, or for domestic help, or to a brothel. Often, particularly in Asia, this is done in an area where the victim does not speak the local language to which they have been uh, taken, and they, the victims never escape their plight. Oftentimes, they are confined to the workplace, sometimes chained, sexually abused, beaten, often branded, and fed at a subsistence level. Shankar, another narrative, was such a child victim. We were forced to work 20, 20 hours a day with no pay. We were half fed and beaten severely by our masters. We were never allowed to go back to our villages or to see our family. Another modern day slave. In one case study in India, a four year old boy was sold into slavery for a loan of $12 so that the family could pay for her brother's wedding. In many areas, of impoverishment, children are the only assets that the parents have. There are documented reports of slavery taking place in all six continents. Forced labor, bonded labor, is prevalent in the coca farms of West Africa, the carpet making factories of India, Pakistan, Nepal, and Bangladesh, and the ranching agriculture logging and charcoal industries of Brazil. Today, women and children are captured in armed conflict in Nigeria, Sudan, Syria, Iraq, and Yemen, and are held as slaves or sold into slavery. We've all read about ISIS and Boko Haram. Widespread, uh, widespread violence caused by ethnic, tribal, and civil war has plagued several South African countries for decades, and the victims are enslaved. These armed conflicts have been fueled by the profits from extract, the extraction of minerals worth billions of dollars to the outside world. These natural resources are mined by children because adults can't get into the small tunnels and are <clears throat> called uh, mineral, conflict minerals or blood diamonds. We've all heard the phrase blood diamonds. Forced labor camps, which is state-sponsored slavery, are prevalent in China, North Korea, and Uzbekistan. The Economist magazine about three issues ago had an ar article on the forced labor camps being created in Western China to um, bring in the dissident minority Muslim groups into the camps uh, similar to the camps you read about in North Korea. So China is uh, a country that practices that.
Today, it is possible and likely that the clothes and shoes you wear, your mobile phone, computer, and laptop, the chocolate you eat, the diamonds, gold, and jewelry that adorns your body, the coffee and tea that you drink, and the food you consume have at some point been touched by the hands of slaves. Slavery has been banned or criminalized in every country, but as we've seen, it is alive and well today, including the United States. The legal prohibition against slavery has not ended its practice. Slavery is one of humans' oldest institutions. Slavery arose with the advent of agriculture about 12,000 years ago at the end of the last ice age. Then a captive in war could be put to work growing more food than they consumed. Prior to that, humans were subsistence level hunters and gatherers. If a tribe or clan fought, a captive would be an unbearable burden, another, uh, another mouth to feed. So a captive was either killed, sometimes eaten, or sacrificed in a religious ceremony. With the advent of agriculture, the first division of labor occurred and the economic concept of surplus emerged. Slavery has been known to every society, culture, and civilization since prehistory. It was and remains an integral part of the human condition. Throughout history, the greatest source of slaves were captives taken in war. Slavery was a substitute for death. Raiding, raiding and kidnapping was also a source of slaves. And as we have seen, the promise of a job, trickery, or coercion are growing sources of slaves today. Most of us learned about slavery and the Atlantic slave trade uh, through our schooling. We learned about slavery in the southern US and we didn't learn much about slavery anywhere else. So here's what, except for you people with the, under the guidance of John here. Uh, <clears throat> here's what many people do not know about uh, slavery. Slavery existed in the New World before the Europeans arrived. Africans enslaved Africans before the arrival of the Arabs or Europeans. The Egyptians and Arabs, and later the Muslims, enslaved as many black Africans for transport to North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia as were taken to the Americas in the Atlantic slave trade. The Ottoman Empire enslaved millions of white Western and Eastern Europeans over the course of some 700 years. And of course, the white Eastern and Western Europeans enslaved the Ottomans that they captured. For some 200 years, the North American Barbary pirates captured and enslaved over 1 million white Europeans and Americans. During the 300 years of the Atlantic slave trade, about 11 million black Africans were brought to the New World. Only about 450 came to British North America, or what is now uh, the United States, the 13 original colonies. So the U.S. was only a mar marginal participant and recipient in the Atlantic slave trade. About one out of 20 came to the United States. 38% went to Brazil, and some 42, 43% to the Caribbean islands. The United States, was the only New World slave society where there was a natural increase through reproduction in the African American population. So while some 450 
thousand Africans were brought to the United States over the course of some 200 years. At the time, at the beginning of the Civil War, the African American population of the United States was 4.5 million, 10 times the number brought over over the course of a couple hundred years. All other New World slave societies of significance had a lower population of African Americans than the total number of imports covering several hundred years. Brazil imported just under 4 million slaves over 300 years, but by the mid-19th century, Brazil had less than 2 million African Americans. The reason for this disparity of demographics is climate, disease, diet, gender ratio, mortality rate, and working conditions. The U.S. had a very low level of sugar production, while, these, uh, while the other countries, the Caribbean and Brazil, were very high in sugar production. It was a very deadly uh, agricultural uh, product to produce. And also, it was in areas where there was high disease factor, tropical diseases, the climate. And in uh, several studies, they believe that the women lost their estrus because of the hard working conditions in the climate and the sugar industry. So if you went to the U.S., you were probably lucky and survived. If you went elsewhere, you probably died. Almost all the African slaves exported to the New World were initially captured by Africans, transported to the coast of Africa by Africans, and sold to the European by African merchants with the oversight of African kings and noblemen. Those who provided them, the Africans, were the accomplice of those who purchased them, the Europeans. This is also true of the slave trade carried out by the Arabs and Muslims of Africans taken into North Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. The legacy of slavery haunts modern-day Western civilization, and particularly the United States. Critics of the U.S. and Western civilization cite slavery among the many evils spawned by Western civilization. However, the abolition movement to ban slavery sprung out of the Enlightenment in Europe and originated in England in the late 18th century. The British and the United States outlawed the slave trade in 1808. The British abolished slavery in all of its colonies in 1838 and the United States in 1865. In the New World, the freeing of slaves rolled through the various countries of the Americas, with Brazil being the last country to free its slaves in 1888. Prodded by the Europeans and the United States, the abolition movement moved to Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. The last Middle Eastern country to declare slavery illegal was Saudi Arabia in 1962, and in Africa, Niger in 2004, and Mauritania in 2007, 11 years ago. Western civilization and the United States did not invent slavery, but it did end it as a legal institution. However, as we have seen, slavery continues to exist today, even though it has been banned, and as I said earlier, there are more slaves in the world today than at any time in the past when it was legally practiced by everybody. It is today the fastest growing and second largest global criminal activity. I gave you about seven personal narratives in this uh, talk. Think how long this talk would be if I gave you the personal narratives of 45 million people. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yeah, so uh, several years ago, there was a, an expose done on Nike, and they talked about sweatshops. Um, 
And then they tried to pass it off as, well, this is good for them because otherwise they wouldn't have any other war. Can you comment on that? Well, the most famous incident of that was the textile shop in Bangladesh that uh, caught on fire and uh, burned down a few years back. And <clears throat> several hundred people died. And they uh, were in a sweatshop like you described. And um, they, they fit the definition of slavery pretty much, except for the possibility of involuntary servitude. So were they there working because they were compelled to work uh, to support their families, uh, or were they there even though the working conditions were awful and they weren't paid a, a going wage, which is another definition of slavery, working without a you know, competitive wage. Um, they, I would classify them as fitting the definition of slavery. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for this presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions tied together. One has to, has to do with, uh, back in 2004, I was in China on some other business and social and such, and I had the personal opportunity to uh, go into some um, factories that were uh, high, higher scale factories, let's say, that they were producing uh, fishing lures and things like this, handmade. And what I was witnessing was an economic servitude. In other words, they were low-paid people coming from, they weren't being brought in as chattel slavery, but nevertheless, they were moving from a almost non-existent economic structure in small parts of China to take jobs in factories where they were, where, which provide living conditions and salary, but very, very low subsistence. And then uh, how, how do you address that within context of the dynamics of this outright chattel slavery? And then this chattel slavery that we're seeing, and you pointed out that this modern day slavery is the second largest next to uh, drug. And, um, and then you did mention the blood diamonds. Uh, my awareness, having done some work at State Department and also overseas, uh, what we really see is an awful lot of the existence of money laundering by nations and its organizations and individuals who are very involved in money laundering. And the money laundering is directly connected to uh, human trafficking, sexual slavery, and, uh, and, and coupled with drug and of course, blood diamonds and that kind of thing. So um, the fueling seems to be coming as much as anything while we, you're talking about the actual on the ground transfer of human beings. And, but the fueling is coming, the monetary fueling for this is coming up, is being driven by money laundering. Have you, what have you found in your studies with relationship to that? Well, I think like any criminal activity, you have participants that start with just individuals acting on their own to organize crime, mm -hmm. mafia groups and that sort of thing. So that's true in the trafficking broad world. China has, it's estimated China has about 3 million slaves. They've had some reports where these people are enticed of a good paying job. They come to a brick kiln factory <clears throat> or a garment factory and they are not allowed to leave. They are sometimes paid, sometimes not paid. So there's there's definitely a gray area in here. And I think you have to ask the individual, the victim, uh, are you free to leave? Can you leave? Yeah. And uh, in the American South, um, most slaves were paid. And they, they actually had better living conditions than white workers in the North white laborers in the north. They were fed more calories, they had more shelter, uh, they had better clothing, they just didn't have freedom. Which, I, I, you know, I, how do we put freedom on that, that scale? Um, so uh, definitely there's um, money laundering that goes on. 
anywhere where there's money. Uh, no matter what the activity is, you'll have people being drawn to it, whether it's legal or illegal. And so the fact that it's <clears throat> illegal, uh, but there's money and profits, like I said, 150 billion a year, um, that, that draws the perpetrators, the traffickers, into it. And I think the question is, it goes a little bit to the earlier question about uh, Nike and some of the factories in uh, Asia. <clears throat> Are these people there by their own will or not? There's a system in the Middle East called kafala, where uh, in some of the Middle Eastern countries, 90% uh, of the workforce are imported. Mm -hmm. And they come in, and then the employer takes their passport, or their documentation, and they sign a work contract. And the work contract basically gets extended by the employer, so the employee can't leave because they don't have their documentation, their passports. I mean, we actually saw a situation then in the 1970s in New York in construction where Polish workers, for instance, their path, they came here to do work and their passports were taken. It took the U.S. government to, to, to right. write that. That was with regard to a, a, a Russian mafia uh, working with New York construction firms. So in my book, I'll get you a question. Uh, in my book, I break it down by geographic regions globally. And part of it's on Russia. There's a Russian ma mafia involved. Uh, Uzbekistan is uh, a big violator. And I tried to have a personal narrative in each geographic mm -hmm. section. And then the current modern uh, assessment uh, done by our State Department and some of these things like the Walk Free Foundation. And then a little historical backdrop. And in some countries, as I mentioned earlier, like um, Mauritania or Niger or even parts of Nigeria, Cameroon. This is part of their culture. It just goes back to the beginning of time. And then, as I said earlier, there's payoffs to the local law, law enforcement people. Like in the drug trafficking, um, they, get a little, they get paid, which is eight times their salary. So why not look the other way? That's in the back. sanction laws, for example, and what role do you think the private sector can play as an actor to help mitigate additional law enforcement, all the other things that happen, but those two variables, do you think they're effective in helping begin to combat this? Uh, the Trafficking Victims Protection Act is a, a federal act. <clears throat> Many states have their own acts. California has their own acts. Um, I think they uh, are helpful. Every law enforcement uh, agency in the United States is aware from the local police station on up, they have training in human trafficking. Uh, the people that are not, not aware are the citizens. So you can have, as in one example, a, a, a domestic help next door, and you have no idea that that person might be a, a pure slave. So one of the purposes of the book is bring awareness to this. And I think the best way to, uh, <clears throat> to do that is to have uh, writings about it and talks about it so people just become aware. When, when I tell people that there's an estimated 60,000 pure slaves in the United States <clears throat> and examples of farm workers and construction and restaurant uh, food service, not to mention uh, sex slavery and domestic help, uh, that's probably way under counting the real number. Because uh, I say, you just don't go into a room and say, you know, who's here as a slave and as a trafficker. So I think bringing awareness to it, the private sector can do a lot. The FBI has a program called um, Innocence, once a year, <clears throat> they uh, target about 12 metropolitan areas. And they go into these at the same time, same uh, period of time. Uh, and they have, uh, this program's been underway for about seven years. They've rescued upwards of 10,000 
children out of sex slavery. Um, so there's, there's involvement at all levels, from the federal, state, on down to the, the local. But I think the average you know, citizen just doesn't recognize when you tell people this is the globe's second largest criminal activity, they're just blown away. Yes? As individuals, what is the most effective thing? I mean, aside from deepening our understanding, uh, is there an entity to which we can focus a specific entity, but with which we can get training that we can depend on to be legitimate? Like, what are the most effective? I mean, it happens to be a passion of mine, and so I'll donate things and everything, but in terms of something that really makes an impact and really is effective, um, are there things that stand out to you that should get more attention than others? Because there are a lot of things out there. Well, I think um, your point about donating time or money to, in the back of my book, I list a couple pages of, um, of uh, anti-trafficking uh, NGOs that are at work, as well as all the governmental agencies, federal and in some cases state. <clears throat> know the supply chain of the products that you buy. Um, th that's really important in the Nike case. Um, I don't know if it's today, you know, exactly this hour, but in the past they've had uh, sweatshops overseas. And so when I say that probably all of us in things that we consume, uh, the hands of slavery have probably been involved in that supply chain one way or another. So, <coughs> excuse me, I think knowing also that even your local law enforcement, your local sheriff's department or police station, they are aware of trafficking. It's part of the training they go through. So it's up to the citizens to observe, like when Homeland Security tells you you're going through the airport or something, observe suspicious behavior. So observe your neighbor has household help and you've never seen that help come out of the house. Or they've only gone out of the house to empty the garbage. I don't know if that answers uh, your question. Well, where can you get training, I mean, specific training for that as an individual citizen? Is there, are there entities throughout the United States where, I mean, I've, I've seen opportunities like that. It's something I'd like to do. I just didn't know if there was a specific one that's the best or if it's so, yeah, I don't know exactly how to answer yeah. that um, because I think a lot of it is local yeah. and what is offered locally. Yeah. But you can go to these different NGOs that are in, listed in the book, and then uh, they're mostly, but not exclusively, global. But a lot are concentrated on the U.S. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if your local sheriff or Police department has uh, certainly they have things you can read, and uh, they may even have some training programs. There, there are a lot of several abolition groups in the U.S. <clears throat> that do provide training, and some of the people I cited in here uh, that were rescued, they went to work for those both law enforcement and the NGOs um, that uh, are involved in trying to. Recognize and free slaves. Yes, sir. Yes, this is an excellent presentation, but it's way too factual. Uh, I find that the most the culture of Smith slavery to be existing only in Georgia, Alabama, and other places in the South. Uh, I don't think this kind of a presentation, which offers perspective, would be very welcome in most quarters in this culture. Have you found? Uh, some of your audience uh, will just not like to listen to uh, somebody who puts the issue in a historical perspective. About 100% of the people I talk to find this uh, unappetizing. I mean, they, <laughs> they, they, uh, no, it's not uplifting. <laughs> this is not a, you know, we're not talking about getting your football team ready to go out on the field. This is a subject that uh, a lot of people probably don't want to really recognize that it might occur in their own local community, much less on a global scale. So it's, um, no, this, uh, I, I'm factual because I'm an economist, so I, I apologize for all the facts, but 
Um, I like to be able to back up what I say. So uh, everything I've mentioned here, there's, I don't know, 25 pages of footnotes in it. So if you think my talk was factual, you'll hate the book. <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, wondering with your background why you chose to write a book about modern day slavery. Was, if there was like a defining moment for you. So I was uh, in college, I was an American history major. <clears throat> and virtually every political and economic decision that was made from the time that Jamestown was created until 1860, time of the Civil War, um, was based on slavery. Free state, slave state, compromise of 1820, compromise of 1850, um, the Dred Scott decision. So just as an American history major, I, I was drawn towards the idea of slavery. And then I was kind of taught, kind of like I think what they teach in most universities, that we were the only slave society. And so I decided to do some research on the history of slavery. And I found out that we were latecomers. The United States was very late in coming. I mean, we were a continent that was by European standards, not founded until uh, relatively late in the human development. So um, <clears throat> I just uh, thought it was a really interesting subject. And then I'm going through the research about the origin of slavery and it goes back to the beginning of agriculture and the concept of surplus. So I'm being an economist, surplus is an important concept and the division of labor. And so it just, I just, I, well, I was writing a book on the history of slavery and my Wife, um, this goes back about a little, 10 years or so. One of my kids came in and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm writing this book on slavery. And she misinterpreted that and went into my other, her sister and said, dad's writing a book justifying slavery. Oh. And that's how that went over. <laughs> and so I, I just, um, my wife said, uh, you know, I had, 500 pages, and she said, just do your last chapter, because my book was a chronology of slavery from agriculture to modern day. And she said, nobody's going to read that. Just do your last, last chapter, which is <laughs> modern day slavery. So that's how that came about. <laughs> yes. Spirit slap comes over you because you're like, if it was your kid, you could think of that. But when you have a resistance, you also have the issue of culture. Um, a country that makes slavery illegal in 2011 or 2000 or 1962, they really probably did it so they could come on the global scene, and that's the only reason. So we have cultural issues as well. So culture can shift economics, economics can shift culture. If it's painful enough, then we don't want to do it anymore because it hits our pocketbook. So as an economist, what is your opinion about the steps that would need to be taken to shift this to where it's, it's too painful for the perpetrators to continue, at least in this massive scale? So I think the key word is make it painful for the perpetrators. <clears throat> and uh, what the U.S. is doing I think is an example, this FBI um, annual program they have. <clears throat> there are other um, programs that are different agencies. Uh, Homeland Security is involved in human trafficking, the State Department, obviously, uh, the FBI. <clears throat> so um, I don't, it, it's such an integral part of the human condition I don't know if it's part of our gene pool or the genome that makes us up or not, but wherever there's money, there's activity. But we certainly can do a lot more as a country under the Trafficking Victims uh, Act because we can sanction countries. But you see how hard it is to sanction a country that's openly violating something today, much less a country where this activity is kind of sub, sub rosa. 
And how do you sanction Niger or Mauritania? But you, you put pressure on them, and uh, the number of slaves, so the, everybody's, I've seen one estimate of global slavery as high as 250 million, so that would be maybe stretching the definitions into some of these gray areas. Um, but I'm, I'm, you know, you just bring awareness to it and punish the perpetrators. I'm so glad you brought up the point about the, about the, the, the economic drives. And that's why I brought up the issue of, of money laundering. Because what's happening is, is from my, some of the work I've done, is that what you're getting is all of the, the countries that are maintaining roles in this, funding is getting laundered through the system, various systems, through banking systems, through our existing banks, through, you know, uh, Deutsche Bank, <laughs> with, with all the money laundering that was going on there and that we were, they were cited for. Uh, a lot of that money laundering had to do with African blood diamonds, the slavery involved there. And so what you get is really some very high level, very visible people who are part of this because it makes them money. They launder money for other organizations that have gotten their money and other states that have gotten their money through this. And these are some of our people that are highly visible in our nation. So I think that the issues, you know, they always say follow the money. They are following the money. Right there's now. a member of, there's a, uh, in um, Bangladesh, there's a uh, outdoor brothel, and across the street is a police station. Now, guess who's being paid off there? There's a member of the parliament of India that owned a brothel. Um, so the money goes up to the highest, you know, show me the money, it goes up to the highest place and it starts at the lowest level. And there's one, so what I don't know <clears throat> is if the money laundering is going through organizations that have to have dollar denominated assets, because then all those assets have to clear, not all, but almost all of them clear through New York. So if you wanted to catch China's attention on something, you just say, to China, your four state-owned banks cannot do any dollar transactions. That would close China down in ten days, right, John? Well, and so, but so we're not willing to do well, that. Well, it's a very. It's you're right. You're absolutely right. It's it, it's at that level too. Then what we're also seeing it is other ways in which to do it, like through the real estate, globally and domestically in our countries, so and we're where money can be laundered through real estate so that it, and where did that money come from originally? It came from all of these kinds of sources. And so it's not real estate money, it's, it's being laundered that way and intentionally laundered that way to, to be able to, to hand, handle it. And, it, and, uh, and there's laws on the books that allow for non-disclosures because of real estate. So, uh, which again, the Justice Department is looking into seriously. There's an awful lot here. We're one of the major laundering sites in the world for this kind of activity. So I think that um, I'm assuming this, I don't know this as a fact, that the Russian mafia and the Russian oligarchs are the same in many cases. And they're exchanging uh, dollar denominated assets back and forth across borders. and. Uh, you, you can sanction them, which we have in some cases, uh, and basically that means that they can't do a dollar-denominated transaction. Uh, just as a personal story, I'm also kind of a farmer, and I sold my D6, old D6 Caterpillar tractor uh, to a neighbor for cash, $11,000 in cash. I went into the bank to deposit the $11,000 in cash. Uh, 
it took me about 45 minutes to do that because anything over $9,999, they have to yeah. go through all this thing because of money laundering. Yeah. But not so with real, not so with real estate. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>